processing. So today he will, his talk will be about information theory with kernel methods. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Laurent. Uh, can you hear me well? Probably. Yes, yes. So first I'd like to uh, thank the organizer, Laurent, and everybody here to, uh, to attend my talk. And today I'm very pleased to talk about something which I started during my PhD uh, in Berkeley. And this is a topic which I left, uh, I was not very satisfied uh, with it at the end. And 20 years later, uh, I think I start to have the beginning of a solution to the problem. And just see showing that you have to sometimes to be patient and to spend some time to spend some time alone in the mountain to get solutions. So it's not going to revolutionize the world of data science yet. Okay, so this is really, really much work in progress, but I'm quite excited about it. And so let me tell you uh, uh, about it. So the goal of today will be to compare uh, probability distributions. And this is a very common subtask in many areas of data science. So imagine you have images and you have a distribution of images that, that you see, you have a model for those images and you want to do some model fitting. And one way or the other, implicitly or explicitly, you end up minimizing some distance in course between your model and, uh, and your data. But this has also applications, like you need to compare distributions when you want to test if two sets are the same. Okay, so for example, in many uh, analysis of domain adaptation, you want to quantify how far the training data is from the testing data. This is one instance of measuring distance between distributions. If you do <clears throat> communications or if you do predicted learning and you add some noise to your data, you want to quantify the loss of information and often you have distances over there. And some fees are entirely defined by uh, measuring independence. And this is a classical independent component analysis which uh, started my interest in this topic. So there are many, many subtasks and I probably uh, forget uh, many of them. So why is it difficult and interesting is that the goal is to go beyond the simple cases. So there are two very classical uh, simple cases which you learn uh, at school uh, when the variables take only a small number of values, like two, three, four. And then there are many ways of defining distances from the probability mass functions. And the other end of the spectrum where things are easy are with Gaussians. Okay, so you assume a big Gaussian and then you can compute various uh, quantities based on the mean uh, parameter and the covariance matrix. So this is uh, all nice, but in most problems, you have more complex dependencies and often non-linear dependencies. And this is what makes it uh, difficult. The other difficulty is that you need to estimate those quantities from data. Okay, so this is uh, one extra difficulty. And finally, uh, you would like your measure to have some physical meaning. Okay, so in information theory, you have physical meaning through the number of bits you need to encode the distribution. And we'd like to preserve something like this so that uh, you can give some intuition to the, to the number that you obtain at the distance. So here I'm using the word distance in quotes, noting that in many cases, it won't be distances, but more measure of uh, dissimilarity. So first, a few uh, classical frameworks. So I think... <clears throat> One is information theory, which I will like build on uh, in this talk. And this is easily defined where you have uh, distributions on finite sets X and the Kullback Leibler divergence is uh, right, written from the probability mass functions P and Q as a sum of P log P over Q. Okay, so it's a very nice uh, property. It's always uh, non-negative equal to zero if only P is equal to Q is invariant by various reparametrization. It has a strong uh, physical interpretation as, for example, the number of extra bits you need to encode uh, P if you use Q or vice versa, I forgot. It has also a strong link with probabilistic inference. Okay, so if you give me, uh, if you give me a, a log density and you want to estimate one, uh, expectation of some quantity given the other, you end up having uh, entropies uh, 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 coming along, in particular to the uh, classical duality between maximum likelihood and maximum entropy, which I will come back at one point later. But it's still hard to estimate beyond like small discrete and Gaussian distributions. 
and you're often uh, faced with a curse of dimensionality. The number of samples that you need in dimension D will typically scale exponentially in D. Okay, so this is one classical way of measuring uh, distances, well adapted to low dimensional problem and, and Gaussians. Then uh, we have the expert here, Gabriel Perret and others, of course, who can use optimal transport, and uh, which is defined, so just to define as a, a, a coupling between your two distributions, P and Q, a joint distributions with marginal P and Q that minimizes the expected distance. Okay, this is a W1 Wasserstein uh, distance. So you can read the book by Gabriel and Marco uh, about it, it's very nice. And you get some nice physical interpretation through the base distance. So you start from a distance and then uh, you get uh, the optimal transport. That distance was not present in the uh, information theory uh, example, and here it is. And you often face a curse of dimensionality in terms of uh, number of samples. And if you want to compute it, it's more or less difficult. And there is like lots of work trying to do that in uh, various dimensions. What I want to focus on today is the third uh, 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 framework on the block, the, uh, the framework where you're based your comparison through moments. Okay, so typically you define some moments. So typically in 1D, you would take uh, x, x square, x third, x to the third, x four, etc. But in high dimensions, you would take all monomials. And in general, you take some feature map phi, which goes from your input space x X could be R, RB, or whatever you want. And you define some feature map, typically in some Hilbert space. So if you prefer, just take RD for simplicity. And you represent your distribution P through the uh, expectation of phi. Okay? It's often called the mean element, mu P. And uh, it belongs to the Hilbert space. This is how you're going to characterize your distributions. So there are many nice properties of that uh, mean element. And this was launched by essentially Arthur Gretton like uh, 15 years ago. And that's quite nice uh, tutorials in, in various ways. And the, uh, given that you have some Hilbert space structure on your moments, you can simply use the norm in the Hilbert space to uh, define a metric. And here a true metric between P and uh, true metric, at least uh, close to the true metric between P and Q by simply comparing the mean elements. Okay, so this is uh, uh, interesting. It does characterize fully the distribution if the Hilbert space is large enough. So if you use any dimensional uh, space, it typically it's fine. Uh, it has very nice properties in terms of estimation with a rate of convergence, which will not explode in dimension. So here n will be the number of samples. So if you want to learn on images, then the, the number of images, the, the rate, of convergence in the number of images will only be like one over root n and not one over n to the power of one over d, d being the dimension. So you get naturally the uh, um, no curse of dimensionality in terms of n. And if uh, uh, you can estimate it only based on the kernel between x and y, which is the dot product between phi of x and phi of y. And in many cases, it is like the whole area of kernel method. Uh, phi of x may be very large, high dimensional, and think of phi of x as, for example, all, all Fourier components, okay, all the exponential of omega i times omega x. And you have omega, which would be like a lot of frequency, typically infinitely many. So you won't be able to build phi, but you can compute the kernel in close form. Okay, so it's a classical kernel trick. So this has, again, many applications. There is a very nice uh, <clears throat> tutorial by uh, one day and, and colleagues. And, and this is used like in, in, in many places. But to me, the, what I felt unsatisfactory after my, my PhD is what the lack of link with the classical notions coming from statistics. So if you work in statistics, this quantity, which is essentially the L2 distance between the probability mass functions in the discrete case, is what is essentially what we are asked not to use in the in statistics reasons which are not always explained, but you uh, there's a lack of clear interpretation of that uh, quantity is a problem. And the goal of the talk is to see if you can keep those nice properties, but have a link with something which has, which has a physical meaning. In my case, this could be information uh, uh, theory. The goal is relating the first 
classical framework to that uh, that framework. Well, so this is the goal, and now let's uh, move on to the how how we're going to do it. So uh, we're going to go beyond just the mean element and look at covariance matrices. Okay, so if you don't want to look at the Hilbert structure of the problem and just want to take RD, we're going to build the covariance matrix, which is just the second order moment where we take the expectation not of phi of x, but of phi of x times phi of x transpose. So here the star is for transpose or for the, uh, for the um, tensor product. I use a star because I'm going to, to need tensor product later, and also because I want to be working a complex number at one point. So you take covariance matrices, okay? And uh, if you like uh, uh, functional analysis, and this is the definition of the, of the operator. And what you can always, what is always true, like all covariance matrices or covariance operators, it is like self adjoint, like symmetric. And also positive semi definite because each phi times phi transpose or phi star is a PSD, positive semi definite, hence the expectation is also PSD. So we're going to use one tool coming from information theory, from the quantum side of information theory, which is the quantum entropies. And this, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start with a von Neumann entropy, which is the trace of sigma p log of sigma p. I will define it uh, uh, later. It's just a summary slide uh, for, for the talk. And given the entropy, you can define also the relative entropy. And we have seen an example of that with the Kyle divergence. Okay, we just build on the entropy you can, you can build the relative entropy as a by mind divergence i come back to that in a moment and what we're going to do we're simply going to do that okay we replace the norm of mu p minus mu q mu q by the relative entropy between sigma p and sigma q okay and this will have nice consequences uh, uh, the one which i prefer is a, with a clear link with regular information theory okay uh, like it would be an upper bound the lower bound of the true uh, KL divergence. You can still estimate in one over root n with very natural estimators. You can use it in, in various uh, places where you will use entropy, and I will mention two of them. In the way uh, to characterize independence or dependence in multivariate modeling, and also in a variational inference, uh, typically the entropy is used uh, uh, for that. All right, now let me move to the, uh, to the more technical details, and everything is available in this archive uh, uh, preprint. All right, so first, uh, a few assumptions on the, on the problems. I'm going to assume I have my phi map phi of x, and the kernel k of x, y is just a dot product between phi of x and phi of y. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that x is compact, and, the, and this is important, that the uh, kernel values are bounded by one. It will, it will often be equal to one, and many uh, kernels are like that. So take the classical Gaussian kernel, you get uh, the diagonal is, a, is always equal to one. But I'm going to need uh, something which is less than. Then we know that this defines a, a space of function. And so here uh, you can simply uh, uh, imagine that we're going to consider space of functions which are linear in phi of x. This is a classical uh, 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 way uh, uh, People use kernels in practice. So you look at functions which happens to be which happen to be linear in the uh, phi of x. Okay, and, and the uh, uh, element f is an element of the of the vector space. All right. And so the key uh, here for that those functions can be uh, quite arbitrary. Okay, and if the kernel is large enough, and for example, I've mentioned already that the kernels based on Fourier transforms, then typically you can represent approximately all functions. And one classical example is the Gaussian kernel on which you get all uh, uh, infinitely differentiable functions. Okay? But the way to think about it is that phi of x essentially, and I will show this in the next slide, phi of x, phi of x is like all uh, Fourier components, exponential of i times omega transpose x for many omegas. So first thing, which is like uh, semi-automatic uh, from the definition is that uh, sigma p here as a covariance matrix or covariance operator is positive semi-definite. The trace is less than one because k of xx is less than one. So it's a classical uh, property. So as 
an operator which is safe or joint, it happens to be uh, with finite trace, you can define a sequence of eigenvalues which are uh, decaying to zero. So if you're in finite dimension, you have finitely many of them, otherwise you have a sequence tending to zero. And uh, <clears throat> what you can show is that if the, uh, if the um, kernel is big enough, so if phi of x is big enough, sigma p is totally characterizing p. This is what I, what I mean by the mapping from p to sigma p is injective. So same properties as with the min element, but extended to the covariance matrix. So to me, the example that is my motivation here is to look at data, like vectorial data, so 0, 1 to the d. So here, I'm restricting to the torus 0, 1 for simplicity. I'm going to consider uh, uh, kernels which are invariant by translation, like k of x, y is a q times x minus y. And it's known that those uh, are kernels, so they correspond to some feature map if q has a positive uh, Fourier series. That's the classical, uh, um, the usual uh, characterization of, of kernels. And uh, to see that all, all of this is just like infinite dimensional matrices, this corresponds to phi of x, which is indexed by ZD, okay, and with all Fourier atoms, which are rescaled. Okay, so the rescaling is important to make sure that uh, the trace is equal to one. If you don't put that, then the trace is infinite and it, it, it won't work. Example, uh, you, you may want to put some exponential uh, dependence on the frequencies. You put more weights on the small frequencies, and this is typically what, what you do. But and the whole goal of going like using kernels that you can go beyond and any any set X on which you can find, you can define a kernel can be used and you can have can be finite sets. And we come back to this in a moment where uh, with the classical like one hot encoding, if you have K values, you take few of X in RK where you, you send all uh, discrete values to the uh, elements of the canonical basis and you get uh, this finite embedding. But this extends to uh, more general uh, uh, classes. Okay, for example, the, uh, the Boolean hypercube. Ah, so this is just to give you examples. But now, what is the quantum entropy? So this is uh, this dates back from uh, quite a while, and in fact, I found back my uh, my books from uh, quantum compute quantum mechanics from Polytechnic, and they were mentioning all the things I'm going to mention now. So I had totally forgotten, but uh, this was, uh, I studied this uh, long ago and forgot. Uh, so what is the volume entropy? It's the trace of A log A. Okay, so here, again, A is an operator, so like a symmetric matrix here, essentially. And the log of the symmetric matrix is simply, you take uh, the eigenvalue decomposition and you uh, keep the eigenvectors intact and you just, uh, you, uh, Take the mapping only on the eigenvalues. And if you take the trace, you're going to sum all of these eigenvalues. And in that particular case, you look at all the eigenvalues of the matrix or operator A, and you sum them lo lambda times uh, log of lambda. Okay, so if you are just sum of lambda, you get back the trace, but you get the sum of lambda times uh, log of lambda for all eigenvalues. So you can show this a convex function of, uh, of A. Okay, A as a matrix, an operator, and why? Because every function, which is the trace of F of A, when F is convex, is also convex. Since you have a convex function, you can define the associated Breitman divergence. So if you know what it means, it's, uh, you can define it, and you end up exactly with the, uh, often, the often called the relative entropy, which is uh, like the quebec Kleber divergence for uh, operator. So, so key properties, of this, there are many others, and in fact, I've tried uh, in my preprint to reprove them from first principles, not because those persons were not uh, clear enough, but because their knowledge base was not mine. And so I did spend quite a lot of time understanding uh, 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 their proofs and rewriting them with uh, uh, the classical tools coming from context analysis and machine learning. All right, so those are all names from uh, quantum mechanics, most of them. Uh, so first, this is the way this one is easy. Since uh, the relative entropy, the Breitman divergence of a strictly convex function, it's positive, non-negative and zero if only A equals B, this is easy. 
uh, also as a Bayman divergent, it is always convex in the first argument. This is easy. What is not easy, and in fact, this is uh, something which is quite uh, difficult to show uh, from first principles, at least if you have never seen it, is a fact that it is jointly convex in A and B. Yeah. So this is a, a classical when you have P log P over Q, this is jointly convex in P and Q. This is the same here uh, for matrices. So these, those type of properties have many applications throughout like data science. I would like to mention two of them because there are two topics which I find quite interesting. The first one is to show uh, matrix uh, concentration inequalities. So if you take Hubbing inequality in 1D, if you take uh, data uh, like uh, random variable in, in uh, 0, 1, you know that the probability that the upper equal mean deviates from the expectation for ID data will convert exponentially fast. And this can be done when you replace data in 1D by, uh, by matrices. And this is used a lot in many areas of kernel methods or data science. And there's a very nice book, of a tutorial by uh, Joel Trop. And the key tool is really to use the fact that this is a jointly convex function. Hence, the Fenchel dual is also convex. And this is where everything comes from. And very nice, very nice uh, tutorials by Joel Trop. This also is used quite a lot in optimization as a way to smooth uh, to smooth the maximum of uh, the max maximum eigenvalue. So it's known that if you have the max of n numbers, you can take the log sum x for those numbers. You get a smoothing of uh, of the max, and you can do exactly the same thing with the smoothing of the largest eigenvalue by the exact same tools. So this is used quite a lot. But I'm going to I'm not going to use it for that. I'm going to use it uh, uh, to define, to get properties of my uh, new notion of relative entropy, which I will call the kernel relative entropy, which is uh, simply the uh, von Neumann relative entropy between uh, the covariance operators. Okay, so it's not, so this, as far as I understand, is that this has no interpretation in terms of quantum mechanics, but this is, I'm reaching really the, and I have like, Went, I've gone past it, the limits of my knowledge, but this is like a notion which has is have P and Q, which are densities, and I'm just using the quantum bit as a tool. I'm going to use a quantum interpretation as a way to get proofs, but I'm not aware of an interpretation. So if you have one, please let me know. So small, uh, first properties, which are like <clears throat> uh, Reasonable. First, it's finite if uh, P has a density with respect to Q, which is bounded. Okay, so why it's not automatically finite? Because in infinite dimensions, you get infinitely many eigenvalues. So you want the sum here to be convergent. So you need some assumptions, and those are met. Those are met quite quite quickly. Uh, it's always not negative because it's a Bayman divergence, and it's equal if only it's equal to zero. If only if uh, P is equal to Q, so we see that the kernel is big enough, like universal. And the key here is that it does preserve uh, properties of the relative entropy, which is a joint convexity in P and Q. So D is jointly convex in sigma P, sigma Q, because sigma P is linear in P and same thing for sigma Q, linear in Q. You get joint convexity for free. So here I'm going to talk only on the relative entropy side uh, to define the true entropy. It's a bit more uh, complex because you have to subtract, you have to you have to subtract something which is not always easy. So I will not uh, go over it. So if you want to know more, uh, you you can uh, go to the uh, to the preprint. Right. So uh, what I will show now is that some properties of the true relative entropy are satisfied, but not all of them. Okay, and it has to be the case because from very nice properties uh, of the entropy or axiomatic characterization of the entropy, if you verify all the nice properties of entropy, then you are the entropy uh, to a constant factor. So we are going to miss something. And what we will miss is how it deals with conditioning. Okay, so this is like really for the experts, but I'm going to miss something. Otherwise, I'm just defining a new entropy and I'm not. All right, so uh, let's look at first a simple example. And uh, if you take the finite set X with a one hot encoding, so phi of X is uh, an element of the canonical basis for every X. So then you can, you can get that phi of X times 12 X transpose will always be a diagonal matrix. 
So all of the covariance matrices are diagonal uh, covariance matrices. And even better, what you have on the diagonal is the probability mass function. Okay? So you map P to diag of P. Okay? And the nice thing about that is that all diagonal matrices can be diagonalized in the same basis. Okay, so when you see log of sigma p and log of sigma p and log of sigma q, then you need to know the SVD of sigma p and sigma q. And for that case, it's all diagonal. So just do the computation that you would do uh, usually, but on the diagonal. And what you obtain in that is just a very fancy way of writing the uh, classical relative entropy. Okay, so in that case, for the orthonormal, orthonormal embedding, D of sigma p and sigma q is just the classical uh, Shannon relative entropy. Question is, does it go beyond finite sets? Can you can can we draw a link between how this notion and this notion in, in the general case? And in fact, you can, and it will be the only mathematical slide with a proof. But I like the proof because it's two lines, and also to me, uh, uh, I like it a lot because it, it draws a link. Which I didn't know existed, and the proof is really is really here. So let me go. Let me uh, 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 guide you the proof. Guide you through the proof. If not interested into proofs, just like pause for two minutes. But the, and the take home message will be that the new distance in all cases, okay, as soon as the feature that bounded by one will always be a lower bound on the true uh, uh, Shannon, the true by uh, classical Shannon relative entropy. And the proof is simply a uh, 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 genetic inequality and using properties of the uh, uh, von Neumann entropy. So first line of the proof, just the definition. Okay, this is just sigma p. And this is just sigma q, uh, where I'm going to uh, use the uh, uh, density of q with respect to p. And here, assume it exists for simplicity. Okay. So what you get here is the integral of of something with respect to p of x and the integral of something with respect to p of x and d is jointly convex in the two arguments in the two arguments so this is where the joint convexity is important if you just uh, if you just marginally convex it's, it's not going to be true now we can use a uh, uh, genesis inequality the value of the expectation is less than the expectation of the value Essentially, I'm getting the dp of x outside of d with an inequality. This is what I'm doing here, just gen sense inequality. And now I'm back in business because I have, I have matrices or operators, but I know for sure their singular value decomposition. Why? Because now it's rank one. So all the values are all zero. Okay. And there's one other value, which is just the norm of your x square. Same thing here. All the values are zero except one, which is the uh, square norm of your of x times uh, 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 this. And even better, the two eigenvectors are uh, uh, aligned. So now I can compute, I can compute the uh, trace of lambda log of lambda. And you, uh, after one layer of computation, which I have not put here, you end up with a closer formula. So the two matrices uh, share the number of of x squared as an eigenvalue. And this one has a one. This one has a, a, a dq over dp. This is what you obtain. Uh, uh, uh. And then you use the fact that features are bounded. So there has to be a, 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 a constraint. Otherwise, uh, things will diverge. And um, you just, this is less than one. And just by re rewriting, by taking this to be equal to one, you get back the classical trend. So this is. Very nice application of Jensen's inequality. Right. So a few questions. Okay, so you have an upper bound. So what? And uh, first question before that is how tight is it? Okay, because uh, I could have a lower bound on D of PQ is zero. So this is a nice lower bound, which is not very useful. And how can it? How is it better than zero? And so here I'm not going to give a details, but here uh, if you Put some extra, <clears throat> some extra assumptions like a metric space assumptions so that P and Q have uh, densities which are lattice continuous. You can provide a, a natural result, uh, a natural like uh, 
this term, but this approximation is a bit between the true entropy, the true relative entropy, and the one which I've just defined, based on some quantities which I will not describe. It's all computable, but the quantities that depend on the metric, okay, and on uh, and on the function h, which I will not define as well. But this can be this can be controlled, and the nice aspect is that I had the proof of this, which took like. 10 pages and was ugly with lots of constants. And uh, it turns out that after using a quantum reasoning, like a quantum measurement, uh, you get uh, with, a, with a data processing inequality for quantum mechanics, you get like a two line proof, my 10 line proof. So as a consequence, and this is what, uh, what matters uh, here, is that for my example, the torus in dimension D, then you can show that the distance will depend on the bandwidth of the kernel. Okay, so this essentially will be the bandwidth of the kernel. So it's, this is almost the Gaussian kernel in the, in the, the torus, and we see the bandwidth. So if you have a small bandwidth, then you get a close approximation to the true, to the true uh, carrier divergence, always from below. And if sigma is large, of course, uh, no. So there will be a price to pay to have low sigma, as you may expect, and we will see this in a moment. Well, so now we know that we have a lower bound. What we can do with it, we'll see like in a moment, but uh, can we really uh, estimate it? If we can define uh, a density uh, measure of distance or divergence and you can't compute it from data, that's kind of useless. And it turns out you, you can compute. And in this next few slides, I will only compare the, uh, only consider the uh, estimation of one term of the relative entropy. The half term, which is a sigma p log of sigma, sigma p log of sigma p. So we'll see how we can estimate that. So what what is tempting? Okay, and this this is what was used in the, for the min element, where mu p, were, which was the expectation, was replaced by the empirical mean. So if I give you data, you take the average of all phi of x i, and this gave you like a natural estimator for the expectation. Here, similarly, there is a natural uh, estimator for the covariance matrix or covariance operator, which is just the empirical covariance operator, uh, sigma p hat. So what is very tempting is to replace sigma p by sigma p hat. And it is both tempting and uh, it works, in fact. So you can first, you can compute it because remember that from the start, Sigma p was a covariance matrix in a very very large dimension, so even infinite dimensions. So it's hard to compute eigenvalue decomposition of large operators. But it turns out that we can essentially extend what was known from kernel PCA uh, to that setup. Essentially, the eigenvalues of sigma p hat are the eigenvalues of k over n. So this is something you can you can uh, you can show. So you can replace the von Neumann entropy of sigma p hat by the one of k over n. And now k is a kernel matrix of size n by n. And this can be computed. This is still n cubed, but then uh, we could we could like uh, use all the nice ways of reducing the complexity and uh, uh, using a particular nice term to go back to uh, linear and n. But I've not explored it, but this can be, uh, if you're worried about n cubed, and you should be, and cube can be quite uh, intense. Uh, uh, this can be probably low. All right, so now we can estimate it, so we can compute it. But does it lead to nice estimation? And it turns out it does. So, uh, so here the goal. I will make assumptions, but I will describe them in a moment. This is the L1 distance between my estimator and the true value, and. The key element here is that it goes down to zero as one over root n. Those are just like other terms I don't want to uh, uh, talk about. The important aspect is the uh, constant over root n, okay, with the constant which I can uh, 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 compute. And so here, what you can show that the constant has some value, which will not tell you anything if you're not used to kernel methods, but in Kind of, I thought this is a, a classical uh, 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 quantity, often called the leverage score. Uh, and so essentially, you take the integral of the leverage score over all regularization parameters. This is a constant C. And that C will be finite in, in many cases, particularly the spectrum of your 
Fourier transform goes down to zero uh, sufficiently, sufficiently fast. And what you can show is that on my torus, okay, that constant C, so torus with the sigma, the bandwidth of the kernel, you can show that C is proportional to the sigma to the power minus D, okay? And so a few uh, consequences is that now I have this C over root N estimation of uh, sigma, sigma P. I know that from such an estimation, I get uh, the true entropy up to O of sigma square. So now I can try to balance sigma square and C over root N. And if you do that, you end up like with a, a, an entropy estimation, right? Or the true entropy with some, uh, with some um, performance. So you see here the curse of dimensionality. You have to because estimating entropy is difficult in high dimensions. It's not optimal. I will miss, I miss a factor of two, but I was reasonably pleasantly surprised to get something which was, which was not too far, uh, too far off. Keeping in mind that the goal was not to estimate the true entropy as, as from the beginning. One interesting aspect that is no need to regularize here. Uh, so although we're going to take a log of the eigenvalue, uh, this is uh, controlled without the need to add some uh, regularizer. All right. So now, uh, uh, so just as a way to show that it can be implemented, it's just a very very toy experiment. Okay. So I take. The density in one D, I take ID samples and I and I take uh, I want to estimate the true entropy, which is like in black, and I'm estimating by adding more and more samples and with various values of sigma. And uh, you see that uh, uh, when n is growing, you get to convert to some place. Okay, and from above, you can show this is just a consequence of a chance sense inequality. And the distance to uh, the true value in black will depend on sigma. So we small, we know that typically is O of sigma square. Uh, and so when sigma is small, you get close to the true value. This is the case for one fourth. But if sigma is bigger, you get further away. So just for illustrations that uh, it can be uh, implemented at least in the simplest scenario. All right. So maybe <clears throat> for the last like uh, 15 minutes, let me describe. Uh, other uh, so applications. So, what? Why would you care about having like some lower bound on the true entropy? So, two uh, two applications, like two applications, two illustrations. I would say the first one is to characterize independence. Okay, so I, like I had done half of my PhD on that on that problem. And I have like uh, I have uh, uh, two random variables living in x1 and x2. I want to check whether I have a joint distribution on x1, x2. I want to check if the two variables are statistically independent. Okay. And the classical tools, a classical tool for this in information theory is the so-called uh, mutual information, which is the uh, uh, KL divergence between the uh, my density on x1, x2 and the product of marginal densities of x1 times the one over x2. Can we extend this? So it's just uh, semi, uh, semi direct. So for every x1, I have my filter map h1. So I map, I map x1 to phi of x1. I map x2 to phi2 of x2. So x1 is mapped to phi1 of x1 and x2 to phi2 of x2. And in fact, what I had done in my PhD, going back like to 20 years ago, uh, we had decided with Michael Jordan to uh, look at the feature map on the joint space, which was the concatenation of x1 of phi, of phi1 of x1 and phi2 of x2. Okay. And to consider then a Gaussian, a Gaussian uh, uh, KL over that. So let's assume that the data are Gaussian. So, okay, given that we have covariance matrices, is kind of, kind of natural and use this as a measure. Okay. So this was enough to characterize independence, uh, but this was, there were no link with the, uh, with the true entropy. And we had tried to make a link, but was not satisfactory. And uh, uh, in fact, what you need is to not take the concatenation of phi one and X2, but the tensor product, that would be the matrix, essentially phi one of X1 times phi two of X2 transpose. And this becomes your uh, uh, feature map. And then you take covariance of that. Okay. 
And if you do that, you can define a covariance operator on the tensor product. So here I'm going to go over the details, and you can define a covariance operator on each of the individual uh, spaces. And it turns out that you can define now two operators, one of the joint and one of the product of marginal. And this is classical information theory. When you have independent systems, you build the density matrix of the two systems by just taking tensor products. So this corresponds to independence. And so here, this is what, what can be done. And you can define a kernel notion of mutual information. And it does what you hope it should do. It's non negative and equal to zero if only if you're independent. So it's a characterization of independence. And there are many other ones, in particular based on the color quantities. Okay. Uh, but this one is just to check that it does preserve nice properties of the um, true entropy. What it does not do is preserve the nice properties of the conditional independence. Okay. So if you if you lack graphical models and uh, you can define like distributions over like a product of many variables and by making some factorization assumptions and all of those can be characterized through various decompositions of the entropy and unfortunately it doesn't hold for this new entropy so and if it did in fact i would have recovered entropy because i'm I have too many properties to get an extra one without being the true entropy. So this one won't work, trying to find fixes, but not for the moment. What I want to finish on uh, today is on uh, uh, the link with uh, uh, maximum likelihood. Okay, so this is in fact a, a, a very important use of entropy and is through the convex duality and the relationship with the maximum likelihood and a log partition function. What is a log partition function? So this is defined in uh, statistical physics and in uh, statistics. It could be a function f, can be on any space, can be discrete space, can be rd. Then uh, this is just a log sum x function. So you take the expectation of your exponential, okay, and you take the log of it. Okay? And so this is often the normalizing factor in the many uh, when you define, let's say, a density mm -hmm. uh, proportional to the exponential of f of x, like uh, you know the log density, the log density is g of x. If you need to normalize density, you need to compute that integral. Okay, and many uh, computational tasks end up being equivalent to approximating this entropy, uh, this uh, log sum x function or the log partition function. So it's well known uh, in the area of partial inference that this uh, log Partition function has some rational formulation. So this was not invented by Wenrat and Jordan, but there's a very nice uh, uh, book uh, about it. And you can show that this is a convex function. It is it's log sum x, so it's convex in f, but it has a very nice uh, formulation at the, uh, it's a facial dual of the relative entropy, okay, with respect to the first argument. So if you take the supremum over all distributions of the integral of f minus the relative entropy, you can show that you get back, you get back uh, uh, something uh, like that. And the supremum happens to be the density I was referring to earlier, the density proportional to e, e to the f of x. This is used a lot for inference. Why? Because if you can't do this exactly, uh, if you get approximations of d, then you get approximations of the supremum, okay, and then you get like an estimate of that density. Okay, so this is just brief summary of rational inference, but really read that book. And now, uh, if since I have lower bounds on D of PQ, if I just replace this by my new lower bound, now I get upper bounds on the log partition function because it's just like a minus sign, and I can define this upper bound. And, uh, uh, and now it turns out that for f of x, which are like um, quadratic forms in uh, my fit of map, I can compute this uh, using like convex optimization in finite dimensions using SDP. Okay, so I'm not going to go to the details. It will require like a, quite a technical, more technical talk, but this is really uh, uh, the nice aspect of this framework is that you can 
since we preserve from P and Q the complexity properties, we can still use them in convex reality, and which, which we can. And it turns out that we show like the moment it has nice uh, relationship with sum of squares, as we mentioned in a moment. Well, so you can compute. So essentially, now we have a tool, among many other tools, to compute like upper bounds on log partition function. And I will not give any like the simulation, it's simply in one deep to show that indeed uh, this is going to approximate the log, the log partition function. Let me uh, skip that. This can be done uh, oh, and before the one which I like, it'd be uh, the relationship with optimization. Okay, and so this is a, a link which I alluded to uh, earlier. So often if you have the max, between the max and the log sum x, if you put some uh, temperature in front inside the log sum x, the log sum x will tend to the max. And uh, this corresponds to adding some entropy uh, on the, in the dual. So essentially I, I use my duality uh, from before, but now I add some epsilon over there. When epsilon is zero, I get back the maximum of F, okay? But otherwise I get a, a smooth uh, a maximum. So it turns out that uh, because uh, we have a convex uh, problem, you can define the Fenchel dual, and it turns out that you have a, a Fenchel dual without a problem. Okay, so you, and this happens to be this, okay? So for people familiar with like Syncon, uh, this should uh, uh, ring a bell. Okay. And what you can show is that if you let now epsilon go to zero, so the log sum x of the eigenvalue to convert to the maximum eigenvalue, and you can show that as a zero temperature limit, this problem of computing log partition function happens to be minimizing some eigenvalue with some constraints. And really, I'm going super quick here. You can recast it as the uh, sum of square framework that. Uh, uh, Jean Lasser, Pablo Parello have worked on, and on which uh, Alessandro Rudi and Ulysse and Marto Ferre uh, uh, have worked on recently with me uh, 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 in the past. So essentially, if you if you lack sum of squares, okay, and this is very, it's very very like short like slide on short on sum of squares, and you want to give some entropy flavor uh, to your sum of squares, okay, to get like smoothing or to get links with. Um, probabilities, then uh, adding such terms uh, 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 would work. So we can have a closer look in the, in the, in the uh, preprint. Uh, maybe a last, uh, last technical side, and which was uh, kind of a surprise is that, uh, so what has been taught by my PhD advisor, uh, Michael Jordan, that whenever you have an upper bound, you really want to minimize the upper bound. Okay, so this is very natural, and big, this is the really the strong advantage of having upper bounds is that if you minimize them, you always get a better a better bound. Okay, it's a better fit. Okay, it's not the case if you have like not not bounds. So this is one advantage of the bound, and it's better to minimize uh, uh, if the problem is convex, or it's better to maximize to have get a lower bound, or to maximize the lower bound. So it's better if uh, what you maximize upon ends up being a concave function. And it turns out that uh, what you can optimize over is a choice of the feature map. Okay, so if I take a bigger feature map, I should get a better bound. And uh, what, what you can show is that it's concave in the kernel. Okay, so the funny story is that I thought it would be con convex in the kernel and I tried to show convexity and I ended up showing concavity, a bit by chance. So it's, yeah, so I had the wrong MATLAB proof. And it, anyway, so I don't want to know, want to know whole, the whole story, but uh, be careful who is your MATLAB proof. Sometimes uh, they go backwards. Okay. So because it's concave, you can maximize it. And this means that you can get better bounds. And I will not go to the details, but there is, you can optimize and get, get algorithm for them. And let me uh, skip this. Ah. Uh, maybe mention a last uh, extension slide because this is uh, maybe interesting for some of you that like eight divergences. So here I focus mostly on the entropy on the Kell divergence because this was my motivation and with a link with uh, uh, probabilistic inference. But everything I said 
applies almost to all eight divergences. So you replace the integral of uh, p log p over q by the integral of q times f of p over q. So you can check whether f of t is t log t, you recover the entropy. So whenever f is operator convex, I won't say what it means, and this applies to the classical divergences, then everything applies. And all the properties regarding convexity, upper bounds are, are, are applied, are, are preserved. Other things, we can try to look at other quantum divergences. And in fact, uh, it turns out that the relative entropy here is not the best one. And uh, so after talking with like Omar Fozzi in, uh, in Lyon, who's an expert in quantum divergences, to me, this one is just a better one. It's, it's bigger. And since I'm dealing with lower bounds, this can only be bigger. And it turns out that this indeed works, uh, works pretty well. And you can even go further, trying to find the best possible lower bound. And this has nice tights with the um, with sum of squares. And you can look at the preprint if you're very much into a uh, uh, search. All right. So to, uh, to conclude, so I've tried to present uh, links between information theory and, and, and color methods. And really, the, the uh, simply applying quantum quantities to the covariance operator and trying to see if it makes any sense. And in fact, it does, in particular, because you get a lower bound on the classical motions. So because you get lower bounds, you get uh, uh, immediately, you can do a version inference. And, uh, and this is uh, essentially the main, uh, the main contribution is to realize that it was a lower. In terms of extensions, so clearly you want to go uh, beyond uh, cubic. In particular, if you do this version inference, you have here two, here. You have to optimize over this, so you have the algorithm to do this efficiently. And now we have, uh, have some of them. And uh, also you can, yeah, we have not done it, but as soon as you say the word kernels, Okay, I know it's not a fancy word anymore in machine learning, uh, but you, you can open the old books from the year like 2000, 2010, and you can define kernels in many types of objects, okay, graphs, sequences, and so on. So this means that as soon as you can deal with only kernel matrices, then you can deal with objects which are more complex and on which you could now, with that uh, set of tools, compute like a uh, entropies or bounds on entropies. And a few references, so I have two, uh, two preprints and uh, one part of the blog post. And on this, I will thank you for your attention and take uh, questions. Okay, thank you, Francis. Uh, so, Stefan, you can... Uh... Yeah, thanks for this very, very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, there is a, a very standard relation between uh, moments and entropy, which uh, which is the Jane approach, which consists in defining a maximum entropy distribution and then computing uh, the uh, entropy of the maximum entropy distribution. But uh, then in some sense, you're going to get the inverse bound. Uh, you're going to get uh, an upper bound on the, uh, on the true entropy by doing that. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, maybe you've explained it. What is the link with what you're doing? Because there is the same flavor underlying. You have probably yeah. a kernel also. And I, I mean, no, I, I suppose all this can be rewritten in kernel terms. I think that's a, that's a very good question. So essentially, uh, what you're describing is, is, is essentially trying to do this infimum, but uh, uh, with Q being fixed. If Q is fixed, okay, then uh, uh, if Q is fixed, uh, then uh, you're finding the P, which has uh, the moment which you know, mm. okay, and which is minimizing uh, DPQ, but DPQ is like the integral of, of P log P. Mm. Okay? So this corresponds to uh, maximizing the entropy. Okay, so essentially, and this is a uh, uh, but the problem with that is, uh, so you get a lower bound, 
but now how do you uh, uh, estimate uh, uh, the uh, this problem uh, from data it's not obvious how you would estimate uh, so if you have if you have moments but how do you go from moments to the uh, to the uh, entropy this requires some expansion around gastinity for example so often people will use like gram charlie or edgeworth expansion uh, to go from moments to entropies and then you can maximize the expansion in a sense here you do uh, the two uh, at, at the same time but it's not it's not so different uh, uh, to what uh, what you describe it to me it provides a computational way of uh, of uh, of doing it uh, like that okay thanks okay thank you uh, gabriel uh, okay, so, so you mentioned that several time optimal transport and also the NSYNC con. So do you think there would be an advantage of using uh, this quantum entropy in place of the usual entropy uh, for oh. approximating optimal transports and having like ah, better so you want to play tricks? Okay, so I think uh, I'm just saying that this is what you mentioned at some point, like Schrodinger problem, but not with KL, with your KL. Yeah, so I, th I think that's what you can do. And in fact, uh, so this is a game we have been playing with uh, uh, Alessandro. And also Eloise was there and, and others, and I don't know if Ulysse is here. I forgot to mention there is a PhD defense of Ulysse tomorrow uh, at two. So if you want to know much more on sum of squares, you should go to see uh, Ulysse uh, uh, defense tomorrow. And so you can replace whenever you had probabilities, okay, whenever you have you had P, you can try to replace it by uh, sigma P and see what, what it does. Okay. Yes. So here you can define, in fact. If you take here uh, d of x y being the squared distance between phi of x and phi of y, okay, then this depends only on the covariance operators, and then you can get yes. in close form by in close form by using convex duality. Uh, uh, what you have this is almost what we did with uh, uh, François Xavier Vala, uh, Viala and Adrien Vaché and Boris Muselec. Okay, it's almost equivalent. Uh, we didn't do with the entropy penalty. Yes, with the entropy penalty, we could. Some you could, but I, I don't know what it would bring, and in particular, uh, uh, so what I suspect is that the problem of the entropy. You already use the entropy to avoid the curse of dimensionality. Yes, it's already the, the entropy. You avoid it already. So why? But do you think you have like better? Uh, Better constants and better dependency on epsilon, and that uh, could I, be. I don't know. I'm looking for sure you can get multimarginal transport in a very in a quick way. But, uh, so for multimarginal transport, you say this is advantageous with respect to just using. No, oh, because the, um, in a sense, you can compute it. Uh, I would say it's because the formulation is is natural, uh, but what it brings, I, I I I don't know. But to me, it does not. It does not, I think the regular entropy already solves the problem pretty well. Uh, I think if you impose some smoothness like we do with François Xavier Adrien and Boris and uh, et al, uh, then uh, it should help, but better, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. but, but, but are you aware of, of problems where like MMD could be used, but your, your approach would be probably better? Like it, it would bring something. In and fact, I understand it's see, nice because it's connected to information theory, but but would you solve some problems? That's, that's a good. In fact, so, so, so question. So when I say that uh, if you take a, if you take a stats class, we are we are taught not to use the not to use this. In fact, uh, we are taught this is bad in the stats class, okay? Because it it will squash up like small uh, small errors of small density. You, this will be dominated by the large density uh, element, okay? And the domination by the large density element will allow you to get one over root n, but you lose uh, the effect of, of placing with small uh, of small mass. Okay, it's just hand waving. Okay, and, and in fact, this is my to do list. Okay, to look at good. the uh, various. So when you often you get a lot of folklore knowledge in statistics and in every area, when people say you should not use that, why is not always clear, and so I'll I'll, I'll check exactly why. And uh, to me, uh, this is uh, where, when you see why this is a bad thing in discrete data, this should, this should lead to interesting things for, uh, for us. But clearly, I, this is not, to me, it's not a replacement for MMD. 
Mm -hmm. It is a representative of LMD if you want to link your measure with something special. If you take, for example, differential privacy, sometimes you want to measure, you want the measure to have some physical meaning. MMD has no physical meaning. Okay. Uh, optimal transport has some, but okay, you have to uh, really be good at interpretation. And I think what I like in information theory is that there is a strong, uh, there's a strong meaning, a physical meaning. But, but clearly, I don't know. Uh, okay, I would be interested in having like a simple example. Where... No, 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 no. But the, the I have to admit, I've given up my utilitarian uh, uh, way of presenting things. It's okay if things do not lead to a better it's perfectly place okay. immediately. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? No. No. Okay. So one, one thing for the ones who are in the in area third or fourth floor, where you can can come and get coffee to talk about it if you want. <laughs> it's only for the in area fourth or third floor. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Francis, and uh, see you in one month for the next uh, call. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for the invitation and have a good uh, have a good day, all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francis. Thank you. Bye, bye, Stéphane. Allez, hop, hop, hop. Je peux itérer sur